All right, welcome back from spring break. Hopefully you guys had a good week off. We hit the next half of the semester and then suddenly you'll blink and you'll be done and proficient in all this software and life will be great. At least that's my hope, right? Um, so we're going we're gonna to continue with one more day in Illustrator. I apologize, it wasn't supposed to happen this way. We were supposed to finish Illustrator right before break, but such is life. Sometimes it doesn't work out exactly the way you want it. So we're going to do one more day in Illustrator today. Uh, and I'll talk a lot about brushes and, and diagramming techniques. We're going to have a lecture on architectural diagrams. Um, I know that this is geared a little bit toward the architecture people, uh, the, the architecture students. However, it's the same kinds of things that you're going to have to do if you're in industrial design or in your graphic design. You're still going to be doing these same kinds of design sketches and, and concept uh, drawings. So we'll, a lot of the same techniques will apply. So uh, I apologize if it's a little heavy on the architectural side today, but it is kind of the way uh, the world works sometimes. So we're going to spend today one more day in Illustrator working on that, and then we're going to move into AutoCAD. And a lot of you guys are already kind of familiar with AutoCAD. If you've never seen AutoCAD before, don't panic. It'll be OK. Um, it is not possible for me to teach you all of AutoCAD in two and a half or three weeks. So you will not be super proficient, but hopefully I'll give you the pieces that you need to succeed going forward. At least that's the idea. Uh, those of you that are really proficient in AutoCAD, I still think I might throw you a few things that you haven't experienced before. So it'll still be worth your while. Uh, and then we'll move into SketchUp, and then we'll go back into Photoshop, and we'll go back into InDesign, and then the semester will be over. Right? That's the way it plays out. So today, we're going to talk at length about architectural diagrams. And I'm going to try to walk you through uh, why they're important, and also uh, what they really are. And so fundamentally, what is a diagram? A diagram is a way of explaining your major design idea. So if you're in 220 and you, you have to come up with your you know, architectural school and you have some, some idea that you're basing your whole design on, your diagram is where you show that idea. It's where you, you bring that really simple clarity to your project. It's not supposed to be the whole plan. It's not supposed to be the whole building. It's just the one critical idea. And that's what you want to be able to see uh, and or show. Provide a clear and easy to under understand exclamation. <laughs> Clearly, I just got back from spring break, too. I can't even talk. Provide a clear and easy to understand view of your project, of what this design idea is. And I'll show you a bunch of examples today. So it'll start to sink in a little bit more. When you're first learning to diagram, it takes time and practice, and more practice and more practice. Because you have to figure out, how do you distill that big idea into one simple drawing? And the better you are at it, the quicker you're going to get there. And really, the place that you're going to do all this practicing is probably in your sketchbook. Because it's easiest and fastest just to draw with a pencil or a pen or whatever it is that you like to draw with. Because you're going to get your ideas out, and you're going to be not drawing, and if you think about this, it's logical. In your sketchbook, you're not going to be drawing measured out floor plans, for example. You're going to be sketching. You're going to be saying, ah, this is about this size, this is about that size. You're exploring relationships. Those are diagrams. Those are diagrams of your thought processes, diagrams of your design process. Um, and so that will help you kind of explore this. If you're stuck, try adding color, switching from pen to pencil. The best diagrams have a little bit of a combination of both, usually. And I'll show you a bunch of examples of those later on. So you know, get your, get your colored pencils out, cut out images, glue them in. Those kinds of things can help you get, quote, unstuck, should you be stuck in a diagramming technique. So here's a picture of a sketchbook. Uh, this was my first semester in grad school at Berkeley. This was my sketchbook about halfway through the semester. And I picked this page. I'd obviously, I took the picture a long time ago. But when I photographed the page, I picked this one because none of the drawings that are on this page were actually done in the sketchbook. Every single one was done uh, on the back of a napkin, on a piece of tray, somewhere else. But I still collected them, and I taped them into the sketchbook. So if you don't have your sketchbook, you're out to dinner with somebody, and you come up with that brilliant idea, and you draw it on the napkin, you always, you always hear people talk about the napkin ideas, right? Well, take that napkin with you and tape it into your sketchbook. That's fine. It's fair game. So just don't forget about taping it in. These are all just diagrams. You don't see any buildings here. You don't see any floor plans here. They're just ideas. I moved from that style sketchbook into uh, this Japanese fold sketchbook. This was the one that I used every subsequent semester. 
Uh, afterward, I really, really liked it because it was one long continuous piece of paper and you could draw over the seams if you needed to draw something longer. Um, but I show you, this is another example uh, of one of my sketchbooks in grad school. A lot of text, a lot of, lot of handwriting notes and that sort of thing, but then a lot of drawings mixed in. And because this was kind of a fluid page, it would go back and forth between drawings and text uh, as, I was, as I was drawing. You really, when you, when you work in a sketchbook, you have to find the right size and the right medium for you to work in. Like, um, I used one of those Statler .3 pens that were black. That was my pen. I liked to draw on that pen. It was my favorite. The .1 was too small. The .5 was too fat. The .3 was just right. And I found that I really liked this style of sketchbook. And it took a long time. I was in, I was, my whole undergrad, I never touched one of these moleskin sketchbooks. And then when I was in grad school, I tried a bunch of different sketchbooks because I just, I was never happy with the spiral bound, the, you know, the normal one that you guys see in the bookstore and that sort of thing. So I kept trying and trying and trying. Finally, I found these. These were the ones that I really liked. Uh, they're compact and the sheets were long and you could just keep drawing, which was, which was a good thing. So don't be afraid to explore what you're working with, what you're drawing with. So let's look at diagram types and examples. And this will help kind of solidify what this idea of a diagram is. So in terms of diagrammatic techniques, we're going to talk about each one of these in depth as we go forward. We have the figure ground. We have highlighting. We have arrows and flow lines. We have components. We have text and typography. And we have movement. And the truth is that it's pretty hard to distill these into just one category. So you might have arrows and flow lines with some highlighting. Or you might have some text and typography with a figure ground. Like combining these together ends up happening very frequently. So just be aware that they end up kind of overlapping. Uh, but I'm trying to distill them out into separate categories to talk about. So let's start first with the figure ground. And so I'll, I'll show you guys this. This is Gian Battista Noli's Plan of Rome. It was in 1748. It was considered to be the most accurate plan of Rome that had ever been made at the time. You guys can't see too much. Anybody been to Rome before? One? OK. It's an awesome city, too. It's fantastic. The food's really good, too. Anyway, um, this is Noli's plan of Rome. Let's zoom in on a piece, because you can't really see that uh, from that far away. This is how he drew the, the plan of Rome. It's, it, it's a very stark contrast. There's a, there are black areas, and there are white areas. That's it. Let's zoom in a little bit more. So this happens to be the Pantheon. And I picked this so that you guys, uh, very name noteworthy building. Uh, and I'll show you a bunch of pictures of the Pantheon a little bit later in lecture. But what is Noli actually mapping? Is this truly a plan of Rome? Not really. It's a diagram of Rome. So we've got white areas and we've got black areas. There's a contrast between the white area and the black area. Anybody know what that contrast is? Building a streets, close, close. But inside this building, inside the rotunda of the Pantheon, it's not a street. So it doesn't quite qualify. Any other ideas? That was a good one. Nothing? How about public space and private space? OK, so everything that is white in Noli's plan of Rome, you as a public person just walking in the city of Rome, can go into. Everything that's black is private. You can't access that. So he's not actually mapped Rome. He's diagrammed Rome in terms of public space and private space. So this whole solid and void or figure ground diagram is a contrast diagram. This versus that. Solid versus void. It's always that contrast. And this diagram technique is used today. You go into a museum. They show you these kinds, of, these kinds of diagrams. So we look at level one, level two, and level three of this museum. The white space is what you, as a museum goer, gets to access. And the blue space is the stuff you don't get to access. It's the back of the house stuff. This is a project by Rem Koolhaas's Office of Metropolitan Architecture. It's another library competition. And I show you this because it's all about solid and void. The whole project is about solid and void. It works in model. It works in section. So here's their models. This is back when you didn't have a laser cutter and you had to cut things out with like a 
old school X-Acto knife. And here we are looking at this building. It's in section this time, so we're not looking at it in plan, but the same technique is being used. And it happens to be the same kind of public-private idea here in that the white spaces on this particular drawing are the places that are open for you to read in. So these voids like that are open spaces. You congregate there, you meet your friends there, and all of the black space, all this stuff, is where the media is held. It's where the books are held. That's where the density of the stacks is. So he's drawing this particular building in terms of where's the stuff stored, i.e. where are the books stored, and where are the open places where you can actually read. So it's a contrast. It's the same kind of a study in contrast. And here we are um, at different times of day, etc. Another example here, uh, this is a book called The Endless City. Uh, it's more of a city planning book than an architectural book, but they do analyses of various cities and how they compare. And it's again these kinds of solid and void studies. There we are, different examples, uh, Mexico City, and I couldn't tell you, this is the, it's too blurry for me to tell you exactly what's going on, but the same style, solid and void, uh, as we go forward. I thought this one was pretty interesting. You take the city and then you rearrange its component parts. It's kind of neat. So these are very, very much diagrams. So let's move forward. We did figure ground or solid and void as one strategy. We move on into highlighting. Highlighting is about finding differences within your building. Okay, so we highlight that difference. Uh, it can be done in model, it can be done in drawing. Sometimes people call this color coding. And it makes sense, you highlighter, you know, highlighting, color coding. Um, so it's, it's, it's one way of, of bringing color into your uh, architectural diagrams. So here we are as an example. We're highlighting the old building in yellow versus the new building. Two of the floors are in red. I couldn't tell you exactly what those are. Those are permanent exhibitions. And then we have the, um, the new building ground level that's different, and that's labeled in blue. So again, not all of these, I know the, the, the buildings or the history of what these diagrams are, but they're showing you a lot about these particular uh, buildings. So here's another example. This is very much color coding, where we're going through same building, same drawing, repeated six times. And in this, for different functions, they're color coding. So the meeting facilities are in that uh, you know, maroonish purple color. The management facilities are in blue. It helps that they're separating each of these out into separate drawings. If we did one drawing and we had color coding across the whole thing, it would look like kind of a rainbow. It would be difficult to discern. By separating them out, it's helping the clarity uh, quite a bit. These are a set of drawings uh, from Alex Holgreff. Well, I've mentioned him when we did the portfolio. I showed you his portfolio. He's that visualizing architecture guy. Uh, these are some of his projects. Taking two different slices. So on the left here, we have his diagram. Uh, let me see if I can draw on top of this here real quick. Um, and it's in red. Let me see if I can change to a different color so that you guys can see this. So his building is right there. And there's two different slices that are coming through the building. There's a slice right here that's connected to these. And there's a slice next to it and parallel that's connected to these. And so what he's done is he's taken each of those slices and he's made them come over here. So there's that arrow looking through the building to that object in the distance, which I believe is this one. And then we have this number two. That's the opposite one. So this one here was number one. This one down here is number two. And we're looking there down through the arrow to that target at the end. So we're looking down through the arrow to that target at the end. So he's corresponding the diagram here with the, with the two perspective views that are slicing through the building. So he's using the diagram in conjunction with the building. So they're working together. This side here is the diagram. This side here is more the architectural drawing. Another example in the same kind of theme, this, side, this time we have diagrams on top instead of on bottom. And in this example, the diagram on top 
tells us, so if we look here, tells us we're looking this direction out of the building, and below it, there's our perspective view that's looking that direction. Does that make sense? So he's using the diagram here to correspond to the view that we're seeing below it. So there's a correspondence between the two. Another example here, different colors mean different things. Uh, I believe that this was a, a study in kind of developing a particular cabin design. Uh, this was a student project. I don't know the student, nor do I know the project. But we have two distinct things happening. We have the yellow shape, which means something, and we have the brownish shapes that mean something else. If I had to guess, I would guess that the brownish shapes are like decks or outside space, and they intersect the volume of the building in that one long yellowish shape. So he's highlighting, or she, is highlighting those differences. So I told you before, sometimes people end up putting all the colors on one drawing. Here we have a sectional model. We've got the color codes happening. And to me, this is way too many colors on one drawing. It's starting to read just like a rainbow. And I don't think that's the intent. So if you were doing this, it might be better to separate this out into five or six different drawings with just one color on each drawing highlighting a specific feature. Uh, because I think this ends up becoming a little bit too much. This particular diagram also has a bunch of flow lines or arrows, which is what we're going to talk about next. So it's an example of where things overlap a bit. Another example here, there's obviously a contrast between the red areas in this plan and the blue areas in this plan. I couldn't tell you what they are, but it's pretty clear that they, the architect or the designer is trying to bring about or show you these contrasts. Another example here, two colors, white space in between. The building is the white space. The design is the white space. They're trying to show the contrast between, in this particular case, it was on a river. Um, and so you've got the river on one side, the natural on one side, and you've got the dense city on the other side, which is shown in red. So it's just that contrast between the two. Another example here with a building. Uh, First two are more arrows and movement. We'll get to those in a second. Uh, the last one here is showing all the terraces, the outdoor spaces, as part of this. If I go forward, we'll see a bunch more. Same object over and over again, same building over and over again, highlighting different pieces of the building and how they fit together. In this particular concept, it was about being able to change the spaces over time, depending on what the market conditions warranted, whether you'd have more commercial or less commercial, more residential, less of residential etc. But you get the idea. Another one of Alex Holgraf's drawings. Again, he has a certain quality and style to his work. Uh, but you get the idea that he's color coding and highlighting certain specific features of the building. We're not getting the whole building. We're just getting certain features. And those are highlighted in the red material. So we'll move forward into arrows and flow lines. Generally, arrows and flow lines are reserved for movement or things that are moving as part of your, uh, your building. If you're diagramming people moving through space, that's an obvious one. But it could also be wind. It could also be sunlight. Other things that move through your building tend to have these flow lines or arrows. And so flow lines are simply arrows without the arrow heads on them. So if we look at this example down here, right there, this is in a, in a stadium setup. And so we've got this red line that starts out really fat at the bottom here. And as it moves forward, you see that it branches and a little bit goes down, small a bit. The branch makes the red line a little bit smaller. And we continue up. And as we move up here, we've got another bit coming off. Then we keep moving up, et cetera, all the way. There isn't actually an arrow at the ends, but we understand by the width of the line, the stroke width, because it's tapering, that people are moving through this and that some of the people, let me wipe it off so that you guys can actually see it again. Some of the people are peeling off and going in a particular direction. The smaller it is, the fewer people that are walking. Make sense? We don't need the arrowhead. We just need the flow line to show this. OK, so I'm going to ask you guys for a second, take a break. There is a house that these architects, Takaharo and Yui Tezuka, who happen to be my favorite architects. They're fantastic. I have a book in my office that I, if you guys are interested, I can show it to you. Anybody heard of them before? No? They're Japanese architects. They do tons of work in Japan. 
They have a house that they designed that's called the floating roof house. So you, having never seen this before, I just asked if you guys were familiar with these people, so you're not. If, if you had to diagram a floating roof house, what would you draw? How would you draw that? Try it. Flip your page over, get your pen out, try it. It's an interesting, it's an interesting mental exercise. I know, it's a computer cast. It's unfair. I made you get pens out, right? I'm seeing some pretty good ones. Remember, it's just a sketch. Don't be timid. Just go for it. It should be quick. I think diagrams often are more like a one-liner than anything else. It's like a one-line joke. You get to the punchline quickly. Do you feel like you got there? Feel like you have an idea? Sounds pretty good. I'm liking what I'm seeing. A lot of you are actually really close. So I'm going to show you now what his diagram was, then I'll show you pictures of the actual house because it was built. There's his diagram of the floating roof house. Pretty simple, right? Pretty close to the kinds of things you guys were drawing. So we've got a roof. It appears to be floating. We've got one arrow that's showing movement through the space. And in this case, it's not movement of people, it's movement of air. Movement through the space. Really strong section line that happens to be important to the site. This is the architect's diagram of the floating roof house. So it shows you really quickly, he's using this to describe the house. Is this really showing the house? No. It doesn't show the house at all shows just a little bit of the idea behind the house. So let's take a look at the actual house as we get a little bit more technical. Here's the more technical drawing section through the house. And then we move to the actual house. So the idea here is there's these panels of doors all the way around the outside of the house. You can close up the house with those panels. But other than that, it's completely wide open. You've got a hill beside, behind you, and the house breathes through. I apologize for the folds in the middle. The end of the house here opens up completely, same thing. So the, house, the house's roof is designed to appear to be floating. I like that one as a challenge for you because it's a pretty easy one to conceptualize and try to draw yourself. Another example here, we've got a bunch of view corridors that are established by those red uh, polygons. The white line looking out is telling us something about the view to somewhere off in space. Another example here about interconnection of various spaces through that center black space. We've got a staged, a raised stage here looking out. We've got the arrows looking out from that stage. I think the arrows in this particular diagram are a bit heavy handed. I think they could be a little bit lighter. They don't need to be that bold. Another example here, I said this was about movement through space. In this case, it's about wind movement. I have a little bit of an issue with the diagram in that uh, if it really was cooling, sorry, I have to do this because even though this is not an energy class or whatever, in reality on this, you'd have this and you'd have that, but you wouldn't have that one because hot air rises. So the hot air, if you let cool air in here, the hot air would naturally come up and go back out. So unless you had a really strong headwind coming from this direction, you wouldn't ever get that flow. 
through. So anyway, I just had to correct that. <laughs> Couldn't resist. I have no idea who did the drawing, so um, it is what it is. Components. So in this diagramming technique, you're breaking your building into particular pieces. So I have, uh, I have this, the building has a skin. I pull the skin off the building. It has a structure. I pull the structure out of the building, and I show just that particular piece. It's generally shown in an axonometric or an exploded axonometric where you're pulling pieces away from the building. I think this is a great kind of 3D model that's in this same style. You've got this really fancy skin that goes around the core of the building. They've taken that skin and they've lifted it up. The reason that we can tell that they lifted it up is because they left these little faint guidelines there and there that, that tell us that that was pulled up. So they're paying attention to those kinds of things. It's not a floating skin. We've pulled that up to see it a little bit better. It's really nicely done. Another example here where you've got, uh, these are structural diagrams of where the columns uh, and, and or where the skin go in this particular building. You're pulling those two pieces out and showing just the structure, just the skin. Another example here, anybody seen or heard this of the Sendai MediaTek? No? OK, this is in Japan, Toyo Ito building. This is his diagram of the building. Now, I can't read Japanese, so I have no idea what his notes say on this. But I do have a pretty good understanding of what the building is about. And so if I were looking at this, even, I mean, it's a little unfair because obviously I know what the building is. But if I was looking at this not knowing what the building is, I, would, I could tell that there are these net structures that go through the building, up and down. There are some pretty strong floor plates that represent floors in the building. And there's something else about a skin that's on the outside of the building. So there's three components. There's whatever those netted things are that are going through the building. There's strong floors. And there's some kind of a skin or a wall on the outside. So I've figured that out just by looking at this drawing. So we go forward. Seaweed. What? Seaweed. Does it say seaweed? Yeah. OK. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it. Like I said, I can't read it. Toyo Ito used the same solid void set of diagrams. So in this case, this is a media library. So we've got congregation space, open space. P space for people is shown in white. Space for density, storage of digital media or, or physical media is all going to be in the black space. So same Noli Plan of Rome style, solid and void, figure ground study done here as a series of diagrams. Another more simplified building, or a simplified diagram of the building. We've got these tubes, seaweed tubes or something, that are going through the building. We have strong floor plates, and we have a skin on the building. So you can see where this is going as we develop into what the actual building looks like. A little bit more of a of diagram about these tubes and how they come together and the deflections that are done. And then we get to the actual building. So we've got the big open floors. And we have these tubes that go through. Well, it turns out the tubes that go through house all of the building systems. So the stuff that you need to get from floor to floor go in those tubes. If you want to take an elevator to the next floor, you go into one of those tubes and you move from one floor to the other. If you need to escape the building because there's a fire, you go right through the stairs. There's the stairs going through one of those tubes. These other pieces, they have like building mechanical systems, plumbing. That kind of stuff is going through the tubes. So everything goes inside of those tubes, and the rest of the floors are left to be open. So now I have to tell a side story. And this doesn't have anything to do with digital tools, but it's, it, this is a particularly cool building. So Toyo Ito obviously had to meet building codes. Let's say that you're on the third floor of the building, and there's a fire on the second floor of the building. And you need to get out of the building. You're obviously going to go to the emergency stairs, this section right here, and go down. Now, if you're going down, and you're on the third floor, and there's a raging fire on the second floor, and you're going down, and you're inside this glass tunnel, it's pretty weird to be looking outside and see the raging fire. Right? Little, little strange. So you've got two problems. One, you've got the problem of how do I go down this stair and not have the heat come right through the glass? You guys have all 
like been near a fireplace that has glass doors and the heat comes through, right? So that's a problem. How are you going to get people to go down through this oven, so to speak, and get out of the building? And you've got the other problem of visually, I'm seeing this fire on the other side of the wall. It's burning everything. How am I going to not panic when I go down? So this is where material science starts to come in. And building materials and having an understanding of building materials really makes a difference as an architect. And Toyo Ito is very, very good with materials. So what he did is he used a very special kind of glass. It's called an intumescent uh, middle layer of glass. It's a gel that goes inside the two layers of glass. And that gel will actually prohibit heat transfer and resist flame. It's a really cool product. Actually, if you guys have time later, this isn't actual homework, but it would be worth doing it. If you look up intumescent paint uh, on YouTube or something, this same product that they used in gel form here uh, is available in like a paint. And you could paint it on like a piece of plywood and then put a torch on it and it wouldn't burn the piece of plywood. It's really cool. They do it, they do it. There's a, there's a couple YouTube videos where they have like little structures. One is painted in it, the other is not. And how quickly the one that isn't burns to the ground and the other one that has the paint just stays there. It's really cool. Anyway, so he solved the heat transfer because of this gel that won't let the heat through. So you could go down, but you still have the visual problem of going down. So what the gel does, and this was an option, he chose to, to have this happen. What the gel does is it frosts when it gets hot. So it turns opaque. So that the perfectly clear tower, when there's a fire and you've got to go down the staircase, will turn opaque and resist all the heat transfer so you can actually get out. So it's a really cool way of actually solving a practical problem in a building like this. That had nothing to do with digital tools, but it's kind of a fun story. Okay. So here it is from the outside, looking up at the building. We have those strong floor plates. We have the tubes that punch through. So we can see that that diagram, that original diagram that he created, really tells us an awful lot about what this building is ultimately going to look like. Another example here of a little structural tube. I believe the colors in this tube represent stresses on the tube, but I'm not entirely sure. Another example of an axonometric, an exploded axonometric, where they've pulled building pieces away from that core to show what's happening on the inside. Here we've got the building. We've got these brightly colored little jewels that are floating inside. This is more of a structural diagram where we have this diagrid, these diagonal cross braces for seismic purposes, and how they translate from the abstract into the form of the building. Heat movement through a building, cool air coming in the bottom, hot air coming out the top. Pantheon. This one doesn't actually have an arrow in it, so to speak, but we have something really important showing as part of this building. Anybody been to the Pantheon? You guys? If you went to Rome, how could you not, right? So this, by far, is my favorite building in the world, period. End of argument. So cool. So I'm going to tell you all right now, and you guys all have to promise me, that when you as designers go to Rome, you will go to the Pantheon, you'll get yourself a little coffee, and you'll sit there for 45 minutes. Just sit on the side and just absorb the space. Don't rush yourself. You as a designer need this. It's like food for your design soul. You need to do this. So this is a very, very cool building. Built, uh, and I think it was 118 AD or CE, depending on what the current historical people are calling it. Very old, about 2,000 years. The size of this dome wasn't exceeded until 1946. So it was, it was the largest dome for about 2,000 years. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. And this is on a scale that we really can't fathom here in the United States. We're especially in California. We don't have big buildings like this. This is a huge, huge space. Uh, 150 feet in diameter, 150 feet tall, means that you could put a perfect sphere. If you had a giant ball that was 150 feet in all directions and stuck it inside this building, it would fit perfectly. So this diagram shows us in sectional form that that perfect sphere would actually fit inside the building. So let's look at a few pictures of this, because I can't help but show you the pictures. Uh, this is looking through the front doors coming into this. This was originally uh, a temple, and then it got converted over um, 
I think the Vatican bought it, and so it's now a Vatican property, but it's, it's basically it's a historical landmark. There it is from the outside. Not the most impressive from the outside. And there you are on the inside. So what's really important here to understand in terms of scale is look at all the people. Okay, look at how small those people are and look up at, at how tall the columns are. And then let's go back to that drawing that I had a couple ago right here. Okay, so these are the tops of the columns. This is the little itty bitty person. So we're talking huge, huge building, huge space. Really, really neat. See? Little itty bitty people. Big space. Anyway, you guys can look up more, more images of that later. Sometimes it's about a contrast. So in this case, this was a, a change that happens in the building from day to night. Same view, showing day view versus night view. Just the change that happens uh, on that cycle. Then we get into typography. We spent a whole lecture talking about typography. We've emphasized typography a lot. We can use text or typography to diagram a building. And sometimes it can be really effective. So here's another Alex Holgreff uh, example. We've got the building, and what he's done is he's put in these various pieces what is happening in the building just as text. So we've got the lobby, and these are three different examples. Um, entry option one, entry option two, entry option three. And if we look at this carefully, we can see, for example, right? there's lobby, there's lobby, there's lobby. So we're understanding what's programmatically happening in a space based on that little piece of text. So the overlay of the text can be very, very effective in this kind of a uh, diagrammatic style. Another example here, here, we've got the stage, and it's labeled as stage. There's a bunch of little people on it too, which helps. I believe this is the Seattle Public Library. Um, and you've got the different pieces of what's happening in that particular space. Again, all type-based. Not sure why that ends up being typography. Movement. So this one overlaps a bit with the flow lines. So they're kind of similar. Okay? How people move through space over time. And I'm showing you this separately because you can diagram it a little bit differently. So here we have a, a city street, for example. These are how people are moving through space. So this is something called cab spotting. Anybody recognize this? Not yet? So this is a little bit old. March 29th of 2010. Would it help if I told you that you've all been here? It's San Francisco. So this is fundamentally a diagram of San Francisco. It's not actually San Francisco. What the Exploratorium did back in 2010 is they started tracking the GPS uh, receivers in all the cabs in San Francisco. And so over time, you get a very accurate map of San Francisco, because the cabs drive around San Francisco all the time, based on GPS. Is it actually San Francisco? No. It's where the cabs go in San Francisco. But it gets to the point where you can actually recognize key landmarks within this. So we can tell where the Bay Bridge is. We can tell where the Golden Gate Bridge is. What's the dark line going down at the bottom? 101.2, the airport. Right? SFO. So that ends up being a nice dark line. We can see Market Street really clean. And so we have a really good understanding of the city of San Francisco based on the traffic of, of the cabs in the city. And it's kind of fun to see this evolve over time. In the same vein, this was a diagram I did for my thesis using the same kind of strategy. It had flight patterns over, over SFO. Uh, my thesis centered around SFO. 
So I spent a lot of time dealing with that. This drawing is on all your handouts. This is a diagram that I did. Actually, the original one was by hand. And it had to do with how people move through SFO, same strategy. So I made little dots for people as they move through and, and charted that. Um, that was back before Terminal 2 was open. If you've flown out of SFO recently and you've flown Virgin or American, you flew out of Terminal 2. This was back when Terminal 2 was closed. So there's that big vacant spot where Terminal 2 was, where just a few people did the trek through. Uh, and then other than that, this is where all the people tended to congregate and how they moved through the spaces, etc. So it's not actually the airport. It's how people were moving through the airport. But it still gives us a sense for what the airport is. This ended up being the digital version that was converted afterward. Uh, view diagram, you have a plan. How do you get through this space without, w by creating privacy without doors? So you have that little jog, and you show that in graphic form. So this one's kind of fun. We have obviously, in, in architecture school, you do a lot of diagramming. It's just kind of one of those things that you do. So we were asked, um, this was in the fall before our thesis. We were doing thesis prep. We were getting ready for thesis. Uh, you know, we've been doing all our readings and, and all that sort of thing. And so we were asked to diagram our thesis. And that was a pretty open-ended question. So on one, this was a three by five card. And she said, this was my, my thesis instructor, said, can you, can you diagram your thesis? And I think she was probably expecting, like, this is what my building's going to look like or something like that. And so I did know this is my thought process in my thesis. The first one, which was on the front of the card, was this is what I think I'm doing for my thesis. And then you flip the card over, and this is what actually happened when I started doing my thesis. It all got all tangled and messed up. So this, to me, was a way of identifying just how I was thinking in graphical form. That's a diagram. Another example here of people moving through space, and then ultimately how it transforms that object, that building. These examples are building elements moving. So sun, wind, and that sort of thing. It's a little hard to read. Another example here we've got, to me this is a little bit over the top. And the, the sun graphic is about as corny as you can possibly get. So maybe you, know, you could improve that a little bit. Uh, but you've got lots of arrows showing what's happening in this particular system. I think it would be more effective if the drawing was a drawing rather than a rendering with these arrows on it. Uh, so graphically, it could be improved, but it certainly is uh, a way of identifying things. So the last one that I'm going to talk about uh, in this is the transformation. It is the, this is how it's normally done. What if we did it this way? So we've got the skyscrapers here. What if we laid the skyscraper down? It's those kinds of things. So typically, it's this. What if we did that? So it's just a, it's, it's, a, it's a way of identifying we're changing. We have this space. We cut it. Then we take one of them and we flip it over. OK, so we'll take a quick break. What time is it? All right, we'll come back at 9.05. And we'll start actually doing some diagrams in Illustrator. OK, so we're going to continue on with exercise 116. And the purpose today is to actually practice diagramming in an architectural sense. Uh, if you're an industrial design student and you want to diagram on top of uh, an industrial product, that would be OK with me. So you know, pick a speaker or something and, and do the same kinds of diagramming that we're doing uh, on this. So um, I'm going to pick the Kimball Art Museum as my example. It's just Louis Kahn building. It's uh, really, really great from a diagramming standpoint, especially in section. So that's the diagram that I'll do uh, in section. What I'm asking you to do uh, in part one is to select a building. Hopefully, it's a building that you like. Try to f find a plan and a section of that building. If you can't find one or the other and you want to pick two different buildings, that's OK, too. It's more about the, the practice of diagramming that, than anything else. Um, you're going to pick and you're going to do a diagram of uh, like a plan diagram and or uh, a section diagram. So you're going to do two diagrams posted in one post today. So you'll have two ultimate images coming out today uh, when you're done. 
I'm going to talk through a variety of techniques when it comes to the diagramming. I'm going to walk through arrows and flow lines and all that kind of stuff today. Um, we'll also talk about live paint. I showed that to you briefly before spring break, but my guess is all of you forgot all about it because you just were on spring break, so I'm going to show you that again. Um, and so we'll go through and I'll show you a variety of different techniques. When you're diagramming, it doesn't mean you have to use all the techniques I'm going to show you. So you can pick just one and work with just that one. So don't feel like you have to do everything that, I, uh, that I'm doing. I'm just trying to throw a bunch of stuff at you to get you prepared. Um, so we're going to work through that today. I'm going to do a, a section and a plan diagram. They might not be the best diagrams because, again, I'm showing you the techniques more than anything else. Uh, so I wanted to start by showing you a few images of this Kimball Art Museum just so that you have a sense for, for what's going on. Um, that's the outside of the main galleries of the art museum. The interiors are known for their lighting conditions. They have a lot of natural daylight coming in, though there is supplemental museum lighting in here as well. Uh, but the way that the light comes in, uh, it bounces off of these reflectors on the ceiling. So there's a, there's a skylight right in the center of these buildings, in the center of these arches uh, or barrel vaults. And it reflects off of these little curved pieces up onto the ceiling and back down. So it's really great indirect diffuse light for a museum setting. Uh, so that lends itself to a really good kind of diagram. I started with the pictures so that you guys could see the pictures first. Uh, and then I went in and I found some of the actual drawings, uh, or not his drawings, but drawings of this building. Um, and so I picked one or a couple of them. Obviously, if you're going to use one of these, don't use one that's so small. So it would probably be better to do a search. Um, if we went into our settings, sorry, it's in our tools. If we went to size, we could say larger than maybe 1024 by 768. That just helps get us bigger size um, drawings to work with. So I've already saved those. I don't need to save them here. Now it's time to start diagramming. So I went ahead and I opened up Illustrator. And I'm going to go to File and then New and create just a new letter size document. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. And I'll go ahead and say OK. There it is. Now I need to bring in that plan uh, or that section. So I'll go into File and then Place. So just like in, in um, InDesign, where we went to File, Place, we're going to do the same thing. I'll go to File and then Place. And I have to go find it on my flash drive or, or on my OneDrive. And let me go into today's folder. I apologize. My folders are numbered slightly differently because we skipped a day. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and open up. This one's a little bit simpler version of this drawing. I think this will work nicely. I'll go ahead and click Place. And I get the drawing. And this drawing then is showing me a section view of this particular vault, exactly what I was talking about. So this is more of a building section. It's a true architectural drawing. And I need to convert this into an architectural diagram that talks about what's important that's happening in this particular building. So before I start drawing on this, I want to pay attention to my layers. Because ultimately, I'm going to want this layer to either be really light behind my drawing or maybe turned off altogether. So if I go over to my layers tools, which are the two little diamonds stacked, Right now, I have just one layer. I'm going to go ahead and rename this one layer to be uh, building section. Okay, So I just double clicked on the text here and then typed in building section. And what that will ultimately allow me to do is to lock the layer such that I can't select it or move it or change it, which is great for this drawing. Unfortunately, because I locked that layer, I need a layer that I can draw on, however. So let me go ahead and create a new layer right there. And I'll start working on layer two. I'm not going to name layer two yet, because I'm not exactly sure what's going to go on layer two. But ultimately, I'd come back and rename it. So layer two is selected, kind of in that uh, lighter, lighter blue color. I'll close my layer palettes. And now I can go ahead and start drawing. So the first thing that I need is I need some kind of background pieces of this particular building. So I'll start with the pen tool. And I'm just going to trace over the, the sectional outline, this dark area. Um, so bear with me while I do this a little bit. You guys have all had some practice with the pen tool, so you should be able to do this yourselves. I 
I may need to make some adjustments to this as I come in here and finish it. Something like that. That one's too long, so I'll have to fix that. I'll come back up here. All right. Let me go in and fix a few of those points. So that point is particularly bad, so we need to change that point. It'll be more like that. Move that up just a little bit. Oops. So again, this is with the direct select, the white arrow, but you guys have had lots of practice with this by now, so you should feel pretty comfortable making these adjustments. So once I've created the shape such that I could turn off the building and still have the outline of what's happening, I'll have to go ahead and repeat this because, because this shape here is the same on both sides. I'm going to copy it, Control C, followed by Control V to create the copy. Then I'll right click on it and say transform. I'm going to reflect it. <coughs> I want to reflect it vertically. That gives me my second side. So I've just saved myself some work by copying and, and replacing it. Um, looks like I need to move a few of these points. I'll go to my direct select, select the lower section of points there, and we'll move those down. Oops. That. This one needs to go out a little bit, like that. Why this particular drawing wasn't symmetrical on both sides, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, so what I've given myself, and maybe so I need. This is just the fill. So it's not a stroke. It's not a stroke. I could do it as a stroke. That would be another strategy. But I went ahead and drew it as if there was, uh, that was just, I was filling it in. Well, I would go back through, if I needed to fix it so it wasn't quite even, I'd have to go back through and adjust those little handles. Um, let me do one more little line to represent the floor down here at the bottom. Maybe like that. And now if I were to turn off my building section, we'd still get the basis of my building's shape. I probably need, the last piece that I probably need is this little reflector. So I'll do one more little drawing here. And I'm, I'm rushing. You guys would spend a little bit more time on these to get them right. All right. So I've given myself Theoretically, I know they're not perfect. The basic shape of the building. Now I can start to think about how does this diagramming work. So I've got the section. Now how do I show that light's coming into this building? So let me create a new layer, because I may take me several tries on this. We'll use layer 3 as my diagram. So I'll double click, and I'll call this diagram. I'll do 0, 1 as a starting place. And I'll start with just the basic line diagram. So in this case, I'll use the pen tool, and I'll draw a line that comes down. Oops. Sorry. I had a point existing. Let me go back to that. We'll draw a line that's coming down from above, hits this reflector. So we'll go like that. Bounces to this um, ceiling, and then comes down into the gallery, something like that. I'll flip my colors. Right now, I have a black fill with no stroke. I'll flip it so that I have a stroke with no fill. And I'll change my color. So let me double click on my stroke to be able to change the color. I'll change the color to be more of a, uh, a light color. So we'll say maybe about like that. So as I look at this, it's a little bit too uh, light to really see anything or to represent uh, the light. So first off, let me select it. And then let me go in and change the, sorry, the stroke weight. And we'll make that a little bit fatter so we can start to see it. So something like that. I'm starting to, to feel like I can see this a little bit more. 
it's bugging me that these aren't quite parallel, so let me adjust that just a little bit down here. Maybe like that. Okay, so this is starting to show something. Now maybe I want there to be uh, an arrow on the end. So I have a couple different options. If I select the um, direct select tool and I select this end point right there, I can come over to my um, stroke menu. Remember, if you're not seeing all of this uh, box, sometimes Illustrator loves to hide it by default, so you're only seeing this. If it does, click the little fly out menu and say show options, which will give you all the options. In this context, I can choose from arrowheads, start or end. I started up here and I ended down here, in which case at the end, I could choose from one of these preset arrowheads. So I could come through and I could pick a variety of, uh, of arrows. You know, some rather corny that you might not choose, but you get the idea. So this one tends to be rather clean uh, and nice. So I could do something like that. If I wanted the size of the arrowhead to change, I can use the scale percentage. So I could say maybe 50% and it's going to make the arrowhead smaller. The only challenge there is that the arrowhead stroke width gets smaller as well. So this tends to work a little bit better if it was a solid fill. Something like that. Yeah, like that. Where you're not losing the stroke width on its size. So this is certainly one way to start doing the um, diagram of how the light enters the building. It's very simple very straightforward, easy to understand diagram. Light comes in, bounces, and goes down. Sometimes you don't like how strong this line is or how bold this line is. So instead of keeping this line the way it is, we might change it. Let me take the arrow head off for a second. Go back to none. We might change it and use uh, what are called brushes. So coming down here, there looks like a little can that you'd sit on your desk with some stuff in it. That's the brushes window. And when the brushes window opens, you may see a few defaults. I don't know that you'll see the same defaults, but these brushes uh, are available in Illustrator plus a lot more brushes. And they're designed to mimic various artistic uh, modes. So let me take, for example, and click this fly out menu. And I'll go into open brush library. And you'll see that there's a bunch of others that are available here for me. So for example, I could go into the uh, artistic category, and I could go into the chalk, charcoal, and pencil category, and I get a bunch of brushes that are designed in Illustrator to mimic those various artistic mediums. So for example, here's a charcoal feather, and I could apply that to my line. So that really changes the look of the line itself. I could select my line again, and I could apply this to it. So it's changing the look of the line. I could still make the line thicker or thinner using the stroke menu, but I can go through and I can decide, even something like this, that's more of a pencil line, maybe like that. And maybe this really needs to be a little bit thicker. I'll come over to the stroke, wait, and we'll bump that up. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. In that case, it doesn't look that good. So I might go back to one of the charcoal lines and drop the weight down, back down to maybe one point, and decide, OK, that looks pretty good. In this case, the arrow, if I were to put an arrow on the end, might look a little funny. Oops. See, there it is. It looks funny. So instead, in this particular instance, I might just go ahead and draw the arrow. So I might say, let's just draw this arrow in like that. Let's apply the same style to it. And let me change this to none. There we go. And so I can create my own little arrowhead. We'll adjust its position. And now I've drawn it. So this is a little bit different strategy. You can tell that it looks different. It's a little bit more casual as a way of, of working through it. So I encourage you today to play around with these various brushes and get familiar with the brushes. This artistic chalk, charcoal, and pencil is a good place to start. 
There are lots of other brushes that are available under the brushes menu here as well. Uh, if you go to Open Brush Library, under Artistic, we have Ink, we have Paint Brush, we have Calligraphy Brushes. So depending on what you were trying to create, uh, you, could, you could use any one of those. There are also other types of brushes that are available. Um, there's an arrows set. These are ones that I, I uh, loaded in manually. I'm going to show you how to do that in a little bit. Uh, let's see, anything else here? Well, you guys can play around and open up other, other examples um, of the brushes and apply them. The other thing that you can do as part of Illustrator is if you do a Google search for Illustrator brushes, if I can type, There's lots and lots of brushes that you can download and install uh, and use. So here's a, here's a bunch of different ones, different patterns, different styles um, that can be used, etc. Anyway, go ahead and close that. So that was doing it with a brush. Now maybe that's not the best strategy for how to show the light. We're experimenting here. So I could turn off my diagram one. This is why I did it. Oops, I was supposed to do this on its own layer. I'll move that to the diagram one layer. There we go. And I'll create another new layer called diagram two. And this time I'll make sure it was actually active when I'm drawing on it. And so this time, maybe instead of showing the arrow for light, maybe I'll show light spilling into the space using a gradient. So I'll create a, a fill region using my pen tool. We'll come down like this. So I've made that little region. Instead of having this with a stroke on it, I'll flip it so that it's filled. And, and I could clean up the edges and make it look a little bit nicer. But this doesn't quite work. It looks a little funny. But if we applied a gradient to this, it might work. So if I were to select this object and come over to my gradient tools, which is available right here, by the way, I do have just my essentials showing, so you should see exactly what I'm seeing here. And I could say that, you know what, I'd like to apply a linear gradient. Oops, sorry, not to the stroke. I need to be on the fill, and then I'll go to gradient. And I want to apply a linear gradient. And I want it to go from the top to the bottom. So I change the angle to be at 90. So it's starting here in black, going down to white. And I would like my color to apply right here. So if I had saved my color in my swatches, it would be really easy to pick my color. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go in and, and manually recreate my color. So I'm just going to pick a yellow for, for our purposes here. And so instead of showing how the light is coming through via an arrow, I'm showing it more as a gradient, where the light's concentrated up top and it's coming into the space. So it's just a different strategy for how to go about showing light entering the space. So you could do something with a gradient like that. So what about if I wanted to create uh, a plan and work with the plan a little bit? So I'm going to create another new document. And I'm going to bring in a plan. I'll go to File and then Place. I'll use the Pantheon plan for fun. There it is. And move this over a little bit. I need to shrink this down. I'll use the free transform tool to shrink this down. So that it fits on my page. And you know what? I'm going to rotate this to be at the side like that. So I have a little bit more space around it. So in this particular example, 
maybe, let me go into my layers. We'll call this uh, base drawing. And I'll create a layer, and we'll call this one diagram one. And so in this case, I'm not going to redraw the Pantheon, uh, but I do want to show how people would move into and out of the space. So I'll start with my pen tool, and I'll draw as if I were thinking about how somebody would enter the space. So if I started from up here, and I worked my way through, they'd climb up the stairs, and maybe they'd weave through these columns like this, and they'd come through the main door, and maybe they'd walk straight across, and come over here and kind of look along the wall. Maybe they'd spend a little bit of time here. So you're kind of envisioning how somebody would move through the space. So maybe they came across like that, and they worked their way over. Let me switch to have a fill color so you guys can see this. There we go. I'll continue on. And then they work their way out. And then maybe they came and went away, for example. Then I go back. Let me correct that one little knot. It's going to bug me that it goes back on itself. There we go. So now maybe I draw a second person. So I take the second person. This person came in this way. And once again, it's not giving me a stroke. There we go. And they just did a little circuit. And they left. Like that. And then I'll go back and I'll keep drawing. You guys get the idea, right? And eventually I'd get to the point where I had a density of lines going through the space. that would be showing how people were coming in and going around this particular space. So now, if I were doing this and all of my lines were these big thick lines, it would start to feel a little muddled. And so there are other ways of showing how people might move through space. So instead of having these big thick lines, maybe I would take these lines, and I'm doing them to all of them at once, and I'd say, you know what, let's shrink them down so they're smaller. There they are at one point. And let's make them a dashed line. So now they have dashes, but I want them to be a little bit tighter. So maybe it's a two-point dash with a two-point gap, in which case I'd have little dotted lines. And it might also make sense to take my base drawing here. And I'll come over to the opacity. And I'll drop the opacity down so that it's much lighter. So we can see my lines a little bit better. Maybe it's even, even more. Well, you guys can't see it now. Over there. So I'm starting to, to emphasize just my lines. And I could keep drawing and, and make more of them. Remember, I could also change how these lines appear. So instead of that dot, I could go into my stroke. We could increase the size of the dot. Now they're more like little squares. Again, two point by two point dash. I could also play around with the profile of any one of these. But I'm going to show you how to do something else that I think is particularly useful, uh, especially on these kinds of diagrams. If I want to create a brush for myself, I can do that as well. So let's say that I wanted to, instead of showing these as little dotted lines, I wanted to show footprints of where people were walking through the building. I could draw two little footprints. So let me start by drawing the footprints. Come back. All right, and 
I'm drawing that footprint. If I took this footprint, sorry, let me take these two pieces, and I copy them, Control C, and then Control V to paste. I'll move the next one up here, and then I'm going to reflect it. So I'll go to Transform, Reflect, and I'm going to do it horizontally like this so that the, the footprints are opposite each other. Once I've created those two footprints, as weird as that heel looks, I can create a brush out of those two footprints. So let me lock the base drawing layer. I'll select those two footprints. And all I'm going to do is drag them over to the brushes window. So as I click and drag and drop them in, see how that brushes window turns orange around the outside? I'm going to create a new brush from these two footprints. The type of brush I'm going to create is called a scatter brush. I'll go ahead and say OK. And I'll call this footprints. Now I have some options. First off, I have size being fixed. I have spacing being fixed. I have scatter being fixed. And I have rotation being fixed. On the rotation tab, I'm going to change. Um, oh, and I'll leave it as fixed, but the rotation is going to be relative to the path, not to the page. Size would vary the size of these objects, and I'll show you something where I vary the size in a little bit. The spacing will keep the spacing as fixed. Um, and the scatter, we don't need to scatter these. They need to be stay consistent, so that's fine. So all of these options are perfect. My colorization, I'm going to do a tints colorization, which just is going to allow me to change the color later on. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And you see two little footprints show up in my brushes. Now if I were to take this path, for example, I just select it, and I click on the footprints, well, now the footprints are a little bit too big. So we need to go back to the uh, weight and maybe change it to 0.2. And you can see that now that path is represented by all of those little footprints rather than the dots. So let me take all of them, and I'll apply the footprints brush. Oops. Sorry. I didn't realize I think these other two were on the wrong layer. All right, let me come back to my brushes. And I can apply that footprints brush to all of them. And we're going to make our size at 0.2. And there we go. And so you can see that that starts to represent the traffic of people walking through. So just in the interest of exploring this strategy here, um, one of the other things that we could do is let's say that I drew a bird. And I filled it in, such as it is. I could take that bird right here. I could make a brush out of that bird. Again, you just drag it over. And this will be a scatter brush again. I'll say OK. And here, instead of having it fixed all the way through, we're going to have it so that it can change size. So we'll go random. And we can control how much it can change size. So between 10% and 100%. So the maximum size is what it is right now, but it can get smaller. We can change our spacing to be random. And again, between 10% and 100%. Our scatter, we can have that be random. Um, and let's see here. We want this to probably be minus, we'll go minus 18. I'll type this in. Let's go 30 and 30. So plus 30 and minus 30. And our rotation, we're going to leave it relative to the page, but we'll also say random. And it can be between negative 15 and 15. I'm just making up these numbers as an illustration. And I'll go ahead and say OK. So now it created this. So if I were to draw a path, let me zoom out here for a second. Like that. Again, 
it's just a line, and I were to apply the brush to it, I'd get a bunch of birds that are on that. Looks like they're not changing the scale as much as I'd like. If I double click on it, I can change these. So my size should be random, uh, let's say 200 and 5, and see. My spacing, let's say between 10 and 150. And I'll say OK. And I changed it. So now the, the, the size and the spacing of them is changing. So you could do this with anything. I just picked birds as an example, but you could do it with dots. You could do it with a lot of different things. Um, so th that is how you would create a custom brush if you were interested in creating a custom scatter brush, which is good for these kinds of, of things. The other thing that I told you that I would uh, walk you through today is how to create a live paint. So if I wanted to color code a particular region of a building, I'm going to do a rectangular building rather than this building, just so that we don't have to, uh, to create. No, I guess I could do it. Let me uh, create a new diagram here. We'll call this diagram 02. It's current. I'm going to turn off. that. Okay, so I want to diagram over this. I'll lock this layer. I need uh, some base shapes that represent this particular building. So let me zoom out one. There we go. I'll start with my circle tools, which are underneath the rectangle tool. There's my ellipse. And I'm going to draw an ellipse that represents the inside of the space. And it may take some transformations. Let me fill it in so you guys can see it a little bit better. I'm holding down shift, by the way, to keep this in proportion. And we'll move it up. OK, so there's my, my sphere. It needs to be a little bit smaller. And I'll create another sphere for the outside. Again, I'm holding down shift. I'm going to use the align tools, align center, and align center to make sure that those two line up correctly. Let me add, and at this point I'll go ahead and flip them back so that they have just outlines on them. Do a few more here. I don't have to be perfectly precise with how I do this. So we'll come out, over, and back. Another set here, we'll go out. back. One of the things that I'm making sure that happens is I'm making sure that my lines overlap each other. So there, for example, is an overlap. There's an overlap here. There's an overlap there. That's going to help me as I go through and start to color code this. Uh, let me go and add the entry. One more here, and I'm, I'm approximating a, a bit on this kind of stuff. So now if I were to turn off the base drawing, we'd see that I have this kind of drawn out with a bunch of shapes. I'd like to be able to fill in parts of this shape with color. Uh, and this is something that's relevant to your Charlie Harpers uh, as well. If you draw it all out and you have the line drawing, how do you fill it in? So this is called live painting. And when you do a live paint, it's always a good idea to duplicate your layer before you do the live paint. So all of my lines are on this diagram 2 layer. I'm going to duplicate the layer. I'll click on the little flyout menu here. I'll say duplicate diagram 2. And I'll rename it to be D2 live paint. So it's clear that it's a live paint layer. We'll turn everything else off. And now when I create the live paint, I need to select all of the objects. And I'll show you what happens if you miss an object, too. So I, I deliberately deselected that one. But when you create a live paint, you will select them all. We'll go up to Object, 
live paint and then make and it will change to a live paint group. When it does that, you get little stars in the corners of your drawing or of your selection. I can come down to the live paint tool, which is hidden underneath the shape builder tool. If I click and hold on that, we'll get to the live paint bucket. You can also just press K on the keyboard. That'll get you there as well. And this then allows me to, if I want to pick a fill color, I could fill in a particular region. So I could fill that region right there. Oops. Sorry. I could fill that with a particular color. Now, in this context, I could fill the outside here. I could change the color. I'm a big fan of changing colors whenever you're, you're filling. It doesn't matter what the colors are, but if you change the colors, then it'll be easy to select them afterward. So then this space, maybe I want it to be a different color, so I could fill that one in as well. We'll fill that one in. Now I've got a problem here because I want to fill this, this shape in, the circle, but it's not cutting out for the door because I didn't include that object in my live paint. If we want to add an object, so in this case I want to add this object into my live paint group, I need to select that object and I also need to select my live paint group. There it is. And I'll go back up to object, I'll go down to live paint and I'll say merge. That way, it'll add that one object back into the Live Paint group. When I go back to Live Paint, there it is. Change my color. Now it's recognizing that with the, the division there. So I'll do one more. And I'll paint that particular piece in. When I'm all done with the Live Paint, I'll click on this expand button. That basically creates, it breaks apart the live paint and would allow me to, with the white arrow, select any one of these colored regions. And I could then apply something to one of those colored regions. So for example, uh, maybe I want just the building structure here to be isolated. I could create a new layer. We could call this structure. I could take the green and I could put it up onto its layer. And now that exists just as its own object. So I could take this, I could change the opacity of it to 40%, and I could turn back on the base drawing, and we'd see that the green area was now the structural area of the building, for example. Okay? So that's live painting. Uh, on a particular set of lines, which I think is a skill that's important for you guys to, to be aware of. I think that about covers what we need to cover for right now. I'm going to turn you guys loose and let you start diagramming. You have an, uh, about an hour, hour and five minutes to do these two diagrams. They can be simple, but I want you to play around with all of these techniques to start to be familiar with them. If you end up with extra time today, go ahead and start working or continue working on your Charlie Harper. And uh, that's it. Any global questions? No? Okay.